Kenneth Kale Phillips Jr. Are you ready? I'm ready. Watch your nose. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Um, so let's see. Um, Dr. K Dr. Phillips, do I have your permission to record this interview? You do. All right. Um, where do your ancestors come from? Well, mostly uh, the Phillips came from the British Isles for the most part, mostly uh, well, Wales, uh, but also Scotland and all through the British Isles. I think there's some Phillips in uh, Ireland too. I did one of those uh, 23 and me. Oh, oh, you did? Yeah, and uh, it came out 98% pretty much, it seemed like British Isles, so. Mm -hmm. It, it, where did they come through the when they came to America? Where did they come through? Oh, uh, they came through the East Coast. I do have an expanded lineage, and there are it, we've kind of followed it back almost to Revolutionary War mm -hmm. period. Uh, and I have a copy of it. I have ne I've never really been in depth in the genealogy, yeah. but it's basically all that. We have Macaulay's, Sharps, Phillips, Fitzgeralds, the whole mm -hmm. mishmash. Um. Where were you born? In a little place called Indio, California. And uh, were you born in a hospital or? It, well, I think it was a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, there was a little hospital on Miles Avenue, right across the street from the Aladdin Theater. It was called the Casita Hospital. Casita means little house. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was like, a, it would have a little house, but it was a small hospital. It eventually became Valley Memorial and then it was Valley Memorial for years. And then I think sometime in the 70s, uh, JFK was built at mm -hmm. kind of out on Monroe Street. But Casita was it. I, and most of the people that I know who were natives were all born at Casita. So it was either Casita or Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. Where did you live? Where did your family live? Well, originally when I was, when I was born, um, I had two older sisters and my uh, folks, they had a house in Indio. It was just off of uh, basically Miles Avenue. It was on the corner of Sun Gold and Santa Rosa. So that house is still there. Amazingly, it looks pretty much the same. I, you know, when I'm down in Indio, I sometimes I'll just drive by to check and see if everything's the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, and it hasn't changed a whole lot. That same trees in the front yard that I used to swing from and. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was a great little neighborhood. What was it the, like in the neighborhood? You know, it was you know it was a family neighborhood. Uh, it was one of the kind of place you could be out at night. Of course, you had to be in by the time the lights came on. But uh, it was friendly. There were no concerns about really, you know, theft or or things happening, untoward things. It was not too far from my elementary school, so. We would all walk to school in the morning and walk home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a great little neighborhood, you know. They had uh, they'd have the ice cream truck would come down and the Helms Bakery guy would come down once or twice a week. And in those days, milk was still delivered from a mm -hmm. truck. What was the name of the milk company, do you remember? Oh, yeah, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That I don't know. Now, your dad, he was... What was his occupation? He was a podiatrist as well. All right. Uh, he uh, got his training in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he basically, I think, had a more of a long-term plan to come to the desert. He, they, both my folks were born in uh, Western Pennsylvania, in a little town called Oil City. It was kind of where the, some of the first oil wells were dug in the United States. So it had that Oil City designation and uh, so he grew up there all his life and then when world war ii came and he got into the service uh, he joined the army air corps and lo and behold he got shipped to blythe california so that's where the flight training school was at the time so he, once he got there and uh, he had some time off so he looked up a cousin from the East Coast who lived in Indio at the time. She was involved in real estate. And she was also a member of the uh, uh, city council of the Chamber of Commerce in Indio. And so he said, let me come out. I really want to look around. It's beautiful. It's, you know, it's 
February, it's 80 degrees. This is like paradise compared to Western Pennsylvania. And so he drove out uh, and she showed him around and, you know, after looking, and it was, of course, gorgeous here. Uh, and the weather was good. And he certainly made note of the fact that it, it wasn't clear up to his waist in snow. Uh, so she said, you know, you should really think about uh, moving here after the war's over. It's a beautiful area. It's going to grow. Uh, it's anticipated it'll grow. And just think about it. So fast forward, he spent most of the war in New Guinea, uh, which of course is a tropical climate. And then once the war was over, he came back to the States, moved back, went back to Oil City, Pennsylvania, married his high school sweetheart. And almost immediately at that time, he used the GI Bill. He'd all, it, he had his undergraduate degree before going in the service, uh, but got married, moved to Chicago, used the GI Bill to go through podiatry school, and then as soon as he had a, you know graduated, moved to California and came back to the desert. So in those days, that would have been about 1953. It was unusual to be a uh a resident of India at that time. Is that yeah, right? well, I mean, it, there was not much in Palm Desert in mm -hmm. the early 50s. So, and most of the patient base, there was only two podiatrists in town. There was mm -hmm. my dad and uh, uh, there was another doctor in Palm Springs. So, uh, India was the place to be. The other guy mm -hmm. kind of had the Palm Springs area. My dad kind of had India. And so that worked out well for a number of years. Uh, until 1966, and then once Palm Desert started growing, most of the patients were coming from Palm Desert, and so then he moved the office, and we all moved to Palm Desert. And I was in about sixth grade at the time. Then you moved to Palm Desert. What school did you grad? What uh, high school did you graduate? From? Uh, Indio High. In those days, it was either Coachella Valley High, Indio High, or Palm Springs. So I would basically in those days, you know, it was you, you were bused to Indio to go to school. Mm -hmm. I had a couple friends that went to CV because they were involved in agriculture, mm -hmm. and uh, CV was more ag oriented, mm -hmm. and, and because they had 4-H and all those programs there, which they didn't have at Indio. And so um, I would just take the bus. There was a bus that picked me up on the other side of, uh, we lived close to uh, Shadow Mountain Club. So I'd, that, that was the first stop on the bus route. So I would hightail it over to the corner of Portola and Fairway. If I missed the bus there, mm -hmm. I would run down to mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Village Market mm -hmm. on Highway 111, which was the last stop and catch the bus in uh, to the high school. So, um, what went on at the Village Market? What was that? But well, that was a small grocery store at the time. It was kind of the place. I mean, it, it was. It wasn't where Jensen's is now. It was on the other side of the highway, off the front of the road. Uh, it's it, it's right where um, Angel View mm -hmm. Thrift Store is right now. But I think the thrift store is recently shut down. So I think that's a vacant building. It was right in that spot. And then they moved across the street and it became, I think, Market Basket. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the last stop on the line. If you didn't catch that, you were in trouble. Mm -hmm. You were pretty much on time though, is that? We... Never. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did a lot of hot tailing it from, uh, from uh, the corner of Portola and uh, Fairway uh, down to uh, the Highway 111. In those days, there were so many vacant lots uh, and again, it wasn't, you know, it was at that, that time desert landscaping was much more popular just because it was desert landscaping. I think I had mentioned to you, um, uh, William Boyd, who was Hopalong, lived kind of like right in between. He was two depth blocks down from our house. So it was where, uh, burrowweed comes down and, uh, he had an all open yard. So, uh, he was a super nice guy. He'd be out there, uh, sometimes not that early in the morning, but you know, he didn't mind if I cut through the side of his yard and hopped the fence. He just had a little, of course, a little buck rail fence. And, uh, that was, once I got over that spot, it was a straight shot down to the market. And so in those days, you know, it was a lot faster than I am now. Um, 
tell us who uh, who is uh, Hopalong. Tell us a little bit about. Well, him. Hopalong was a cowboy star, uh, probably starting in the fifties yeah. and sixties. Uh, Hopalong Cassidy. Uh, his signature thing was kind of wearing all black and white, and so his house was actually painted all black and white. Mm -hmm. The body of the house was painted black with white trim. He also had two identical Lincoln Continentals. <laughs> one was all white and one was all black. <laughs> uh, later on, after uh, Hoppy, as he was known, passed away, I had an opportunity to go in the house and, uh, and take a look. And it was all, it was thick black and white shag carpeting he had uh, saddles for uh, seats around the bar. Mm -hmm. It was really a cool house, but it was definitely black and white all the way. He he had a theme going, and it worked for him. So he was a uh, he was a movie star. He so. yeah he was a TV star. A novel. TV star. Yeah. Okay. So he had a series that uh, ran for years. In fact, uh, it was in a place not uh, long ago uh, where they had a lot of memorabilia and I noticed there were there was an actual board game for Hopalong Cassidy in there. I think a lot of those things uh, later on when I got into practice uh, I had uh, Jean Autry's uh, widow as a patient and uh, she had reminded me that how close all those uh, cowboy movie people were and uh, I guess a lot of that stuff was shot up in Pioneer Town. Mm. And uh, even today, uh, for a lot of people, it's become kind of a, a hipster hangout, mm -hmm. I think, more than anything. But they have that whole little uh, kind of set. It's, it's more than a set because they're real buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people go up there on the weekends. There's a, a popular spot called Pappy and Harriet's where people go for music events and stuff like that. Uh, uh, did you... Uh, did you ever see, well, did you go to uh, Shadow Mountain, uh, Shadow Mountain? Uh, club? Uh, practically, club, yeah. uh, well, not the swimming club. I used the facilities a lot. Yeah. And I had friends who had the summer program where they would go and they'd be formally signed up. I was so close. I spent so much time there. It was, uh, I probably should have signed up. But uh, in those you days, they, it, we'd, we'd just go in, you know, and I can't count the summer nights I'd be in there and we'd be swimming in the pool and it was just great. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, my best friend lived on the other side of Shadow Mountain, so there was a constant back and forth back in those days. And in those days, um, around the club, there was a nine hole par three golf course. So that was pretty much open to the public. They didn't care if you played or not. That's where I started playing golf. Mm -hmm. And you could play, we would play endless holes there uh, uh, during, well, all times of the year, you know, after school. You know, his house was right on the golf course. And then uh, I lived on Pinion, which was, it's probably about a hundred yards from the edge of the club. So it was very convenient. And then of course the big course for Shadow Mountain was just south of the clubhouse. Mm -hmm. So as I got older, uh, we would play that from time to time. Mm -hmm. So you'd go there at night, people would gather around there at night. Was it when it was dark or? Yeah, well, okay. if things were, you know, again, lit up. They had a lot of activities at Shadow Mountain. It was, I think, one of the first places in Palm Desert. And uh, they were, you know, it was a real club that people would go to. They had that enormous uh, swimming pool. And in those days, they had like a three and five meter platform diving. Uh, platform uh, set up and they had two enormous slides. So you can imagine what kind of fun that has. I mean, those slides were so tall today, you probably couldn't have them because they'd be too dangerous. But uh, they eventually took those out, but it was just a fun place. And there were so many activities in the summer. We used to, there used to be a, um, a thing called Midsummer Madness, which would be a big kind of festival. It was kicked off usually by a golf cart parade, but it wasn't like now when you kind of do it in the height of the season or on the cusp of the season. Mm -hmm. It was right in the middle of summer, <laughs> you know. So it was a true midsummer madness mm -hmm. uh, event. But uh, so those type of activities 
went on. And uh, summer was a great time. I still think people talk about how hot and how can you stand it, and it's just, oh, I don't know how you do it. But, you know, it, it, to me, even when I was a kid, um, the heat never bothered me. Mm -hmm. And of course, it doesn't bother, you, you know, again, it, it, the, this thing of dry heat. Uh, in those days, there was a lot less water. There were a lot fewer golf courses, so it was more of a dry heat. We didn't get those really mm -hmm. intense humidity sessions, but even those, are, you know, I've lived in uh, Indiana and other places in the Midwest, and uh, I certainly visited those places in the summer, Florida and around. I can't imagine living in 90 degree weather with 90% humidity. Mm -hmm. I would say I would want to five with 30% humidity any day of the year. And mm -hmm. it just, it, uh, I'll give you an example. We went back to Oil City, oh, probably 10 or 15, 15 10 or 12 years ago, uh, to do some family business. My parents wanted some ashes taken back after they had passed away. And uh, after we went to the cemetery, we were in town and I had gone, I went to a restaurant and my kids were with me and my wife went to a restaurant that a patient of mine who was from Oil City had recommended. And so we went into the restaurant and there was practically nobody else in there. <laughs> uh, it was early. And so I started talking to the, um, uh, the owner and uh, lo and behold, she was asking, you know, we, we didn't look like the uh, regulars. And uh, so I said, no, I'm here. My family used to live in Oil City. So she started asking me. And then all of a sudden, not only did she know most of my relatives, but she'd been to my house, our house in Palm Desert on Pinion Street. Oh and so <laughs> I said, I said, so I, I didn't remember her and she didn't remember me. But uh, I said, so have you ever been back to the desert? Oh God, no! And she said, "I'd never go back there. It's too hot." And I'm thinking, it's so miserable here in the city right now, in this 90 degree heat, heat with 90 percent humidity. She goes, "I just sat in front of the air, uh, the fan, the whole time." Like, wow. I, I so there's that perception. People yeah, go, know. you know, but I don't get it. Um, now, where did you go to? Uh, where did you go to uh, podiatry school? I went to uh, California College of Podiatric Medicine in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, lived in San Francisco for uh, four years there, and then I came back to LA to do my additional training at the county hospital. But uh, San Francisco, of course, was a great place to live, mm -hmm. and just the diversity of things. That you always intended to come back here and settle here? Always, pretty much. I mean, I, again, by that time, I had, uh, growing up and in college, I spent a year in Notre Dame, and then I had uh, spent some time working in Wyoming uh, over the summers and had been kind of, I'd been to Europe and around and uh, I still love the desert. I mean, you know, geographically it's beautiful. It There's space here. I mean, and again, the weather, nine months out of the year, you'd have to say it's pretty ideal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd always, always planned to come back. Well, I hadn't always planned to be a podiatrist though. So uh, I had always uh, admired the fact that my uh, dad had enjoyed his practice so much. And uh, I certainly recognized as I got older, the fact that uh, patients were happy because in podiatry, people come in usually with a complaint. Okay, it's not always, you know, diabetic nail care or something like that. But most of the time people come in because they're having pain. And most of these issues, a lot of them are mechanical. They can be resolved quite quickly and conservatively without surgery. You know, whether it's an ingrown toenail and, in, uh, you know, a, uh, in a corn that's pushed through the skin, ulcers, things like that. Things that are really driving people to get relief. Mm -hmm. And again, they go to the urgent care and they're not equipped to do a lot of these small, basically, Ultimately, they're like certain minor surgical procedures. So uh, the fact that we can resolve those quickly in a visit, it, it's very rewarding. Mm -hmm. And the patients appreciate it. I, I, 
have to say that, again, for a lot of my other uh, colleagues in medicine, they're dealing with chronic illnesses. When the patients leave, they're not any happier than the minute they stepped in the office. And there's, a, you know, it's rewarding. I like, I love the patients. I love helping people. You know, we still, you know, my son's in podiatry school now. Uh, mm -hmm. We still do a fair amount of outreach to even to the homeless. I noticed that. And, I was going to uh, ask you about that. Yeah, I, I participate with volunteers in medicine, and even though Locally, my son's is in that school, local? Yeah, that's uh -huh. local. And what 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 does that involve? Volunteers? Basically, a lot. They have a clinic. Um, do they? They do have a clinic in Coachella. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, more, the more interesting aspect is the street medicine. They actually go out into the community and provide services to lots of people who are, at the, and they do render services to homeless, uh, which is again, very rewarding. These are people who don't have access to normal health care, And so the, the clinic, the main clinic is uh, wonderful. It's a great resource for them. Where is, the, is that in Coachella? That's in Coachella. What's it, what's it called? Uh, volunteers in Medicine. Okay. So, uh, great program. What, what are some of the functions that you provide there? Well, mostly diabetic foot care or, you, you know, if somebody has wound care. I don't go to the clinic. Uh, but I have them come into the office. Um, but we're right now discussing opening uh, they want me to come down and do uh, half a day, like on a Saturday, once or twice a month. So we're trying to work out that schedule. And then, of course, I, like everything else, I had to be go through a credentialing thing, and that just got uh, passed at this point. So they said, "You're all clear. Come down and uh, and okay. give us a hand." So, but it's been easier to treat them in the office because in the office, yeah. um, you know, it's a, unfortunately in the world we live in, it's all about liability. Yeah. You want to do something nice, but you got to make sure that it's true. everything's I've done that covered. Volunteering. How long have you had this office in, on El Paseo? Well, the the first office my dad uh, moved into in '66 was on El Paseo. It was right oh. on the other side of Portola, kind of where um, we're probably about 150 yards down from the corner. And then that building got sold shortly after I joined my dad in practice. I joined him in '86. And we expanded the uh, that office within the building, and so after about three years, the building got sold, and so unfortunately, uh, we only had like a two months to get out of the building, mm -hmm. and so at that point we made a short move across the parking lot, and uh, moved into some offices that had just been renovated on the back side of One Eleven right across the parking lot. So that was a fairly easy move, but it was traumatic for most people in the building. That medical arts building was like one of the, it was like the first medical arts building, the first medical facility on El Paseo back in the day. And so uh, there was a dentist who had been in there for 25 years. My dad had been there for 20 years. Is and it still there, that building? No, that building oh. was removed. So it's where eventually the uh, fireplace store went in mm -hmm. and then they moved shortly after that I forget what they call that complex there but that, so we were in that spot on the back side of 111 for exactly five years and then uh, we moved into this building the El Paseo Professional Plaza uh, because it was a good fit for us it wasn't too far it's got great street parking on El Paseo mm -hmm. and they've got a nice big parking lot on the it's back. Nice. So everybody knows where El Paseo is mm -hmm. and it's convenient. So it it's worked out great for about 30, well now we've been in this building about 28 years now. So uh, and the nice thing is when you tell, when you give people the address, they, yeah. everybody, most people know where El Paseo yeah. is. You're married to Ruth Ann. Yes. Yeah, how long have you been married? Oh, we've been married about 33 years. Yeah. Uh, happily married. Good. Three beautiful children. Uh -huh. So, again, right. uh, they have the, uh, and now we're starting to see grandchildren come along. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a real blessing. Where did I you... wish they all lived here, but they don't. But, uh, yeah. Now, um, 
Let's see. Where did they go to school? Uh, where did they go to high school? Washington? Uh, no, they all went to uh, they all went to parochial school. They went to Sacred Heart okay. uh, uh, up through eighth grade. At that time, Xavier had not been built. Uh, and I, my sister-in-law, my wife's older sister, was head of foreign language at Palm Desert High. So they all went to Palm Desert High School. And uh, mm -hmm. then, um, oddly enough, my oldest daughter, uh, Amy, was, uh, all the kids were choir kids. So mm -hmm. they were all high, heavily involved in choir and music. And Sacred even Heart. Sacred, uh -huh. uh, well, at Sacred Heart and then at Palm Desert. Okay. They were all part of the chamber singers. And so I was heavily involved in chamber singers and, uh, for a number of years. As a singer? No, they no. <laughs> I'm more in the fundraising department. <laughs> if I looked like I was going to sing, they would shut me up right away. I said, that's not your department. You're in the fundraiser department. So, uh, so for several of those, it was, that was like a span of nine or 10 years where I always had one kid in the choir and sometimes there was overlap between them because the kids were all spaced three years apart. And so I was president for a few years and we, we, you know, we had a lot of activities. That group uh, was very active, meaning in terms of uh, kind of competition singing. It, it would call it competition, but they would go to music festivals. Um, the first year we were involved, the group went to China uh, for a two week singing okay. tour. So that was great for the kids. What year was that? That would have been, I'm going to say it would have been like around 19, uh, oh, no, not 19, uh, 2013. Mm hmm. But more than ten, more than it was ten over years ten ago. years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, it was probably even more than that. Um, so it was a great adventure, though. The, uh, we had a group of like sixty people. Who oh, did went. you go as well? Oh, I went. Yeah, oh. I went as, of course, the chaperone. Oh, okay. And uh, my wife, and so it was a wonderful experience. Uh, we had about two weeks in China. And uh, I got to visit, you know, the Great Wall, mm -hmm. uh, the Terracotta Warriors. Um, it was just a fantastic trip and a wonderful cultural experience mm -hmm. for the kids. A lot of those, you know, a lot of the kids here uh, had never been out of the valley, some of them. So for them, this was an amazing, mm -hmm. eye-opening experience. And, uh, and for us, going to China it was a, a wonderful yeah. experience, too. So, uh, and uh, we just every, over the course of our involvement with them, we did trips to Australia. Uh, they, we didn't go on the Italy trip. Uh, two trips to New York, trips to Washington. They played at the Lincoln, they sang at the Lincoln Center. They sang at Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. as part of a composite choir. Mm -hmm. And so we had a very active fundraising program uh, that, that helped give scholarships to kids who couldn't afford to go otherwise. So we made sure everybody got on the bus. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, during, uh, when you were raising your family with Ruth Ann, uh, what was the, how did the desert differ at that time from when you were growing up, for example? Well, you know, it's population density more than anything, even though we still, you know, it, it's funny, we complain about the traffic and everything, but all you have to do is drive up to, drive out to Orange County or Los Angeles and you get shocked back into reality mm -hmm. and that things are not quite so bad here. Right. Uh, but it had changed in that perspective, uh, in just in terms of, you know, the number of people, but also, um, there was more access to things here for mm -hmm. kids than they were when I was a kid, more programs. Um, probably, I don't know if it's fair to say, for kids who wanted to work and to have summer jobs and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, it was probably a little better. There were more things to do. Um, like everything else, they, as these kids got older, um, I. You know, the whole it, advent of social media also came into play. These kids are all so interconnected with each other 
you know, much more than we ever were when we were kids. I mean, you had your a couple friends and you get together with them. You weren't talking to mm -hmm. 50 different people on the same day, you know. I, mm -hmm. I had realized one time we were on a trip with the choir and uh, there were several cars going then something happened and they had to make a stop uh, and I realized it was the kids actually communicating with each other through cell phones mm -hmm. figuring out uh, okay let's stop we're gonna get them to stop here and we'll do whatever it is they wanted to do uh, so I realized that made quickly watching the kids made me a lot more savvy as to how what happens what happens mm -hmm. with the, all this electronic communication so um, do you know any of the founders of the city or other high-profile people? Well, I would say, you know, over my, well, growing up, um, I think he's, uh, he's often referred to as the, I don't know if they call him the godfather of Palm Desert, but Cliff Henderson uh, is certainly recognized as one of the founders of Palm Desert. Did you and know him? So or did Cliff, you know oh yeah. He, uh, the house we lived on in Pinion, Cliff lived right across the street, and his wife, Marion, who became uh, basically the head of uh, the Desert Beautiful uh, Foundation. So Desert Beautiful? They used to call it I've Desert never Beautiful. heard of that. What yeah. is that? Uh, it was an organization that promoted ma helping maintain the natural uh, oh. desert beauty. The irony of it is one of the things that Marion would rail... Uh, uh, would rail against uh, would be Grand. trail riding, oh. uh, you know, because now in places where uh, the vintage and uh, up where the reserve and, uh, and ironwood was, it was all open desert. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, there were kids with mini bikes and small trail bikes and motorcycles and stuff. And there were, there were well-worn trails up into those canyons that people would ride in the afternoon or on the weekends. And so part of the, the thing that she really worked against was, hey, you're damaging the topsoil, you're damaging the, you know, the normal, beautiful plant life. And I agree 100% with all that. The irony is that now all that area is covered with cement and condos and houses. And so uh, it adds the price of progress, but again, uh, it, it was a, those areas were beautiful natural mm -hmm. areas to explore and hike as well. But uh, did you was there a stable in in Palm Desert, South Palm Desert? There. Uh, the truth is, I think that you know, to my understanding, and I had never seen it, but part of where um, Jillian's is mm -hmm. that back building, I believe, was part of. Uh, I've always heard that well, that was part of General Patton's old stable. And so some of those, some of those are original, I think, stucco uh, buildings. Not stucco, but um, that's the word I'm trying to think of. Uh, Adobe. Adobe, mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, I noticed in some of the rooms in Jillian's, there are plaques that, that discuss the history of that. But I found that, I mean, when, as, when I was growing up, that area had become, uh, that location had become a Mexican restaurant uh, called Tortilla Flats. Oh, okay. And so it was in its natural kind of element there. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Jillian's is a gorgeous restaurant. Uh, uh, was it before, is it the exact location exact of Jillian? Exact location, okay. yeah. What about Barry Menlow? Come on, was, was he a patient <laughs> of yours? Yeah, Barry has been a patient. I haven't seen him in a while. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I used to see him fairly regularly, um, mm -hmm. and a super nice individual, uh, wonderful art, obviously great for the desert and everything mm -hmm. he's done. So he was kind enough to, he had a, he, he's kind enough to invite all his doctors to the Christmas show. Oh, Santa where was that Christmas show? Uh, at the McCallum. Okay. So. You know, I don't. I, I I think he did last year. I was not in attendance, but uh, you know, four or five nights. It's wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. All the proceeds go to different desert charities. And even when um, my kids were in school, it, one year he donated uh, 
all these instruments, musical instruments, mm -hmm. to the kids. I mean, and I don't think it was just Palm Desert. I think it was throughout the school district. Mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. was a pretty big, wonderful, pretty big deal. What about Ike? Yeah, I was fortunate enough in those days. I was only in fourth grade uh, when I started. To, when he started to become kind of a regular patient during the winter with my dad, uh, but. It, just a, um, such a humble, right. powerful person who had such an impact on the world. Uh, and again, fortunate enough to meet him my, as a kid, my dad, if he, at that time, originally, uh, the general uh, was staying at, Eis at um, El Dorado Country Club. And so occasionally my dad would do house visits over there. And he'd uh, let me tag along mm -hmm. and, uh, just, uh, you know, I'd go, uh, first time I went in there, it was like grandfatherly figure. He was just so kind and nice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even paid a little attention to this kid. Yeah, what did he say? Do you remember uh, what he said? I, I think he asked me if I wanted some something to drink or milk <laughs> or cookie or something. And uh, he, he was kind enough. He did, uh, Ike sent me a letter um, in fourth grade. It was, of course, it was the height of the Vietnam War. And uh, uh, my, I had a fourth grade teacher, at that time I was attending Hoover School in India. Uh, her name was Marilyn Mason. She was, um, had a super patriotic streak. I mean, just a wonderful gal. And uh, so she built this program of sending baked goods and things to soldiers in the field. So mm -hmm. we had to receive- The chocolate chip cookies? Chocolate chip cookies. Pop, I mean, popcorn, everything was packed in popcorn. But we would get these, uh, everybody would bring in um, three pound coffee cans. Everything was packed mm -hmm. in a can mm -hmm. and then in a box. So mainly it was cookies that, we, that would be cooked at the school and then packaged. Mm -hmm. And each student at that time, it was very popular during the Vietnam War to uh, receive contact information for a mm -hmm. specific soldier and so you'd wear a band with that mm. soldier's name uh, as a reminder mm -hmm. of the sacrifice. You, a designated, they, you yeah. had a designated service I man. did, yes. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, I remember his name was What's John. His name? John Peake was Dalla. Aww. And so uh, I don't know what became of John. I hope he made it through the war. Right. And uh, he's, he's living well in the United States in the country that he fought so uh, bravely for. Yes. Uh, how do you best describe the desert and what it's meant to you and your family? Uh, to me, I describe it as probably the best place in the world to live. I mean, besides its natural beauty, the mountains, the desert, uh, you know, its proximity to LA, to the mountains, to go to the mountains, you can go to LA in two hours, you can be in San Diego. You can be south of the border if you want. Uh, I feel, you know, blessed to be here. Uh, my daughter went to school in, uh, uh, my oldest daughter, uh, because she was involved in singing, went to Indiana University, to the music school there, Jacobs mm -hmm. School of Music, as a um, uh, vocal performance major. Unfortunately, in her second year, started to develop vocal cord problems. Mm -hmm. And I think she decided that, that she better have a backup plan. Nothing wrong with being a singing waitress, but you're not gonna wind up at the Met if you've got a lot of voice problems. And so uh, she switched to public health. At the time when she graduated uh, and she got her master's in public health, she said, Dad, I don't think I'm gonna come back to California. I said, why not? She said, it's too expensive. I said, well, there's a reason for that said because it's worth it That's right. <laughs> and so eventually within three years she was back in California again and she stayed with us for a while she lives in Long Beach now because that's where the work is mm -hmm. but uh, I, I all my kids uh, are still living here my son does plan when he finishes pediatry education to come back and I'm hoping he'll take over the practice the way I transitioned into my dad's practice so he could kind of slowly go out as I was coming in. He never, and again, it was one of those things, he never planned on retiring. And my dad, God bless him, he worked 
up to and including the day he died. Really? He came in, uh, he worked the morning, it was in, uh, the, near the holidays. He went home for lunch, he had a bad heart and he had several heart attacks. But again, he was in his 80s already. And so he was working three half days a week, which was perfect for him. And uh, yeah, he went like that. And I think that's the way he, I, I think you're lucky if you go like yeah. that. The only thing that would be easier would be to go in your sleep, but uh, to step from one place into the next quickly, mm -hmm. I think we'd all prefer that. Uh, so then, um, yeah, uh, that was a nice transition. So the desert has provided, you know, for my family and I, a beautiful place to, to live. Mm -hmm. It's got all the resources that we could want, that we need, like I said. I mean, uh, again, the, in terms of what's available here now, I mean, the desert has really grown up. It's, it's kind of, I, I miss that little village yeah. that it was back then. Uh, and it's become, but even then it had kind of a more, it had a sophisticated mm -hmm. side too because of the people that would come here. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the beauty of the diversity here is you have a lot of sophistication you still have the old desert rats that are down here, you know, this core people that have always kind of lived here. Uh, and I think that's attractive to a lot of people because I notice in my patients, because almost everybody is a transplant. Mm -hmm. And it's even since the pandemic, I think it's become even more so that people have just decided this is where I want to stay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is the, this is, it offers so much for them. Um, uh, it's no wonder people come here and yeah. want to stay. I, I mean, I think some of those stay, same things are there that when my dad came out here when he was in the service after coming from, you know, kind of the hills of Pennsylvania, uh, he said, this place is paradise, even if they didn't have great air conditioning back then. <laughs> and it's the, that's the one caveat, and that's the, the saving grace is, you gotta have air conditioning if you live here. Uh, and so, you know, you stay out of the heat in the in midday. Uh, Dr. Phillips, what's your best life advice? Well, for me, my best life advice is, uh, is do what you love doing. Mm -hmm. In my case, I, I just love the other patients. I love helping people. You know, you run a, you every once in a while you run into someone that's not quite your cup of tea. Uh, you know, try to avoid being polarizing in this world of polarization that we live in. You know, I still believe that, and I think everybody should believe everybody has a right to, to their own feelings. Uh, and so I would say just be respectful of other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. You may not agree with them. And so I have a lot of friends that I don't agree with, mm -hmm. but I respect their opinion. And it's really, I don't take it personally if they don't think what I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, that probably comes because I'm every day dealing with 25 patients that all have extremely diverse backgrounds. I'm not here to change them. Mm -hmm. I'm here to help them. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I, I kind of view part of my job as being like, we used to think the news was, you didn't know if the newscaster was conservative or liberal. They reported the news. So that's what I try to instill in my kids yeah. is, you know, don't judge people too harshly. And, uh, you know, be kind to people. Life's short, enjoy it. <laughs>